He's now up against the reality of the politics and it's holding him up. What I think he needs is a policy which cuts right through, but he's still thinking he's being advised by the old advisors, they're still thinking in old ways, and that won't go anywhere. This is why I put forward this proposal, because it cuts right through the old notions, the old smokescreen. You um, have talked in the past a little bit about um, APAC and the idea that um, some people have a, uh, there's a, some consensus in the Arab world perhaps that there's this conspiracy of Zionism, it's a very powerful force, APAC runs American foreign policy. You said in the past, well, I don't really believe that, they're, that APAC's that powerful, it's the presidents themselves who aren't willing to engage in difficult moments with Israel. Well, it's not to underestimate the, uh, the power of APAC, um, but presidents are often able to call their bluff. And, and they don't do so. There have been a number of occasions over the years when different presidents have done so, and without exception, they have prevailed. Uh, the, I mean, it's interesting, actually, if you look at the, 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 the basis of APAC, which is largely two constituents. It's a right-wing Jewish constituency, and it's the evangelical fundamentalist Christian constituency, which had a great impact uh, on Bush. Mm. But the majority of Jews in the United States um, do not support APAC. Um, they, the influence is a, is a sort of an apparition. 78% of Jews in the United States actually voted for Obama. 78% in recent opinion polls support a two-state solution. And there is a new uh, lobby called J Street today. In fact, I attended their inaugural conference in October in Washington, uh, which is attempting to shift the whole of the center of gravity of, of um, Jewish support for Israel to the two-state solution, uh, very much the sort of ideas which many of the Palestinian partners uh, would agree to as well. But if you go back to Eisenhower, um, Daddy Bush, uh, James Baker, uh, even Reagan, uh, they have all at times confronted the, 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 the lobby, uh, have made it clear they had no intention of backing down, and if every time uh, the lobby or Israel uh, backed down. So, it wasn't that I was blaming the presidents, I was saying the presidents don't use the influence they have and I expect Obama to do so as and when the moment is right. The Goldstone Report then being a case in, uh, a case in point, uh, an important moment between the UN and Israel, an important moment on the uh, uh, human rights um, uh, justice movement in the world about the uh, massacre of uh, children in Gaza by um, the, America, the, the Israeli military machine. And yet again, this wriggling by the Security Council, no big statements from America in defense of international human rights when it comes to Israel. Well, the Goldstone report will have had its impact. I mean, Goldstone himself, and this is what really worried the Israelis, um, is a very eminent, highly experienced uh, South African international lawyer uh, who is a proud Jew and regards himself as a Zionist as far as I know. He was, uh, I think his daughter lives there and he was on the board of the Hebrew University. And so what really has upset them that, as it were, one of their own uh, has turned against them. But that's, not the, way, really, but that's not the way he sees it. Are they really that it. sensitive? I mean, this is politics, really? But, but that's not the way he sees it. I mean, you know, not that I can speak on his behalf, but my impression very strongly is he has just looked at the situation as an international lawyer, as a very honest man with an incredible record. And when he sees human rights violations, and he's seen them on both sides, he's also been very harsh on Hamas's indiscriminate rocket attacks on Israeli neighborhoods. He's made no bones about that, and, and he made it perfectly clear he wouldn't even take on the mandate unless he was allowed to explore that as well. But of course, the, uh, the main brunt is on the uh, carnage uh, delivered by uh, the Israeli military. And this will have had its impact. And even if in the short term it doesn't, you know, there's a veto here and, and, and something else there, it has had its impact, and I think Israel will be very, very careful I wouldn't rule it out, but to take similar action again uh, in the future. You obviously work in academic and political circles in the United Kingdom. Recently, Ehud Barak came and spoke at the um, Labour Friends of Israel event, you might remember, a couple of months ago. And because of some fears that he would be pushed on war crimes, his status as a visitor here was changed from private to special status by the Foreign Office. Why do you think, in, in your meetings with officials or in your writings, why, why is the British government, the Foreign Office, still so willing to support people who may be internationally wanted war criminals? 
Well, you know, this is a discussion you'd have to have with the Foreign Office. I can't speak on their behalf. But as far as they're concerned, um, Israel remains an ally. Uh, Ehud Barak is uh, the defence minister. Um, he wishes to come uh, to uh, this country. And so they give him um, the respect that uh, is they accorded. They seem to be kind of out of the loop on world opinion then, to be asking someone who's just launched uh, opera an operation cast-led to, to come and speak at their own party forum. Well, there are other indications as to the way international opinion is going. Um, you may have seen the recent statement by the EU in which Britain played, I understand, quite a leading role. Um, which reiterated very strongly um, that um, the EU does not recognise uh, any annexation of any territories uh, from uh, the, the 10th or 9th of June 1967, that it regards uh, East Jerusalem as part of occupied uh, territory, and it sees Jerusalem as being uh, the capital of a future, uh, of both Israel and a future Palestinian uh, state and you've had other indications. The uh, government department, and I say I'm not, I, I hold no brief for them, um, but I'm but just aware advise, of it. But you do advise, you do advise committees, and you're a consultant, and you're a specialist in this area. So what you write, for example, for the Fabians is read. I don't want you to underplay the, the, the knowledge that you have on this because you've been doing this for 40 years. Well, I'd love to, yes, 40 years is more, more than 30 years, actually. But I, I, and I, obviously, I would love to hope that what I write has some influence because that's why I write it. And if it didn't have any influence, you know, I really wouldn't uh, bother to continue doing it. And there is some reason to believe this. But it's important to know that the a government department recently has issued advice rather than a directive to stores and supermarkets that they must in future mark the produce from the settlements clearly as from the settlements. Now that's an interesting change isn't it? That's quite a big deal. It's almost touching onto the boycott divestment sanctions mm -hmm. campaign. Almost. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a positive campaign that, that uh, international groups should be pushing? If you boycott Israel, if you say they're criminals, is that delaying or helping uh, a Palestinian state to be formed? I think it depends how it's done and what its objectives are. I think the key to effective pressure against Israel is to be very clear what the objective of that pressure is. Um, I, 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 there's a great danger that, uh, if you look at the BDS campaign, I can't say this with great authority, but the impression I get is that it is a coalition of two broad factions. Um, those who are campaigning for the end of the Israeli occupation and those who are campaigning for the end of Israel. Um, they can't agree on the, they don't agree on the objective, but they agree on the strategy. Mm. Um, now that's okay up to a certain point, but sooner or later as any half-decent strategists will tell you, you cannot achieve your objective unless it's, it's very, very clear. So then we were looking at the British government saying you, you, have to, uh, you have to label West Bank produce for the first time, either Israeli settlement mm. or Palestinian produce. What's their strategy? Well, I think what they're saying is let's resurrect the old green line, the pre-June 1967 uh, line, and make a clear distinction between the question of the, the legitimacy of the Israeli state within that green line as internationally recognised, and the illegitimacy of the continuing and apparently indefinite occupation of Palestinian territories, and in particular, the settlement colonisation programme. Mm. Um, so there are two things that have happened. One is uh, they prevented Israel from marketing goods produced in the occupied West Bank by Israeli settlements as made in Israel. And now they are advising, it's not actually uh, legislation, but it's advice, which many will accept, that they can't be marked just as produce from the West Bank. It has to be marked produce from the West Bank from Israeli settlements or worse to that which effect. Which means that internationally uh, accepted boundaries or um, laws within, the, within that area are suddenly being respected, which is a, another very big thing because we know that Israel is in contravention of many Geneva, um, um, Geneva conventions. If, if governments actually start observing those, like on the displacement of people, return, East Jerusalem, illegal occupation, these are all problems for Israel, aren't they? Well, uh, see, I would Sorry, say UN that revolution, I, UN yes, I, I mean, I would, well, there's a lot of different issues you're mm, mixing there, yeah. but I mean, I would say myself that they shouldn't be problems for Israel, because I, I believe it is in Israel's interest, as well as the Palestinians' interest, as well as the interests of world peace, for Israel to withdraw 